Welcome back to another video. Today I'm with my good friend Jamie and we're about to tour his vending machine business. He is 23 years old and he has over 50 total vending machines and he's actually had months where he's made up to $35,000 with his vending machine business. And now you're branching out into a bunch of other stuff which yes. we're gonna talk about uh, in a little while on the video. Jamie, I really appreciate you of giving course. us a tour, man. Yeah, let's get to it. Yeah, of course. So you're 23, dude. Yep. You've been selling snacks since what? You were in high school? My first ever job. Yeah, before I could even work, I sold. I was that kid walking around class with a <laughs> bag full of chips. And at one point, I even hired three of my friends to sell chips for me. So I would give them a box every morning. At the end of the day, they would give me the money, and I would pay them at the end of the week on Friday, $50. Wow. So I, would, uh, I made a lot of money selling chips, and then my first job was at a concession stand, also selling snacks and drinks. Uh, and I was able to save up a good amount of money by the time I graduated and start this business. What was your first ever vending machine that you bought? It was a combo machine. So it's like a, like a two-in-one where you have snacks on top and drinks in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I actually bought it on location for $2,500. No way. But the thing that happened was the next day I got kicked out of that location. And the owner that sold me the machine didn't tell me that he was getting kicked out. So I just had a, I was stuck with the machine how to take it out, but good thing I, I started calling businesses and two days later I found a new spot for it. No way. What yeah. was that business that you ended up finding for that particular machine? It was a barbershop. Okay. Um, it was a great location and I actually just took that machine out a couple months ago because sadly it wasn't doing as good as it was and I didn't want to take it out because I had like that emotional attachment as my first machine on location that I got, but you know, once you get to a certain point, it's uh, uh, you got to be efficient and you gotta make money. So did anybody help you actually get into the vending machine business? Unfortunately, no, because the vending industry five years ago isn't what it is today. So back then, um, I had to learn everything I could. Mm. I had to do a bunch of research on what type of machines to buy, what type of locations to target. Now, I feel like you can go on YouTube, Google, and find a lot of information that can help you. But back then, I made a lot of mistakes, yeah. and I just had to learn by myself. And you didn't have any mentors or anything in the very beginning? At the time, no. I do have a good mentor right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I first started for the first four years, no. Wow, really crazy the fact that you were able to get in and did you ever actually have to like buy any locations or anything like that? Like obviously that first one you technically yeah. bought the machine, right? But not mm -hmm. the location. I got my first couple locations by already buying the machines placed mm -hmm. and that was a great way to get started. Most of the locations call me, mm -hmm. so I've been able to build a good website and rank up on Google. So I get most of my leads through um, Google and yeah. I don't really have to go out door to door or call businesses as much as I did the first couple of years. Through Google, it's very interesting. Have you ever had any um, locations call you as a result of the content that you put out? No, and uh, I don't know if I would want to. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, you know, I love making videos, but like most of my locations have no idea that mm -hmm. I make videos because it's private businesses, it's yeah. office buildings. So I don't want them to think that I'm going to just run in there and start screaming, you know, what's up, everyone? Yeah. Let's see how much these machines made. So I keep it very professional. I love that, yeah. which is really good, right? Because at the end of the day, the content is more to help the people that want to get into vending. Yeah. And then the actual business is again, like you're keeping it private yeah. for the, the owners. Yeah, exactly. You like know? I was telling you, vending is something I want to do forever. So I want to build great relationships with my customers. And do you think vending will be around forever? I think it will, right? It will be around forever, but technology is advancing. You know, I got a couple things I can show you in just a bit yeah. that kind of reflects that. But yeah, it's just constantly improving and there's a lot of great stuff coming out. I'm excited to talk in a little while about the mini marts and you're doing like water and coffee. coffee. There's all kinds of things that you're doing, which we'll get to here in a little while. And uh, right behind us really quick, I mean, this is a really cool wall you got going on here. <laughs> yeah, I try to make it look nice. <laughs> yeah. So talk to me, like, what do we have going on? And in a little while, we'll go inside too. I know you have kind of the inside area, yes. but is this where you keep everything? Yeah, so these are all the snacks that we sell on our vending machines. Everything you see on top is all the chips. We kind of keep two boxes of each. And then we have the shelves separated by the, the category. So here we have some pastries, uh, candies, cookies, crackers, and then some extra stuff as well. We were in the warehouse, obviously, and uh, you've got a lot of your chocolate indoors where there's air conditioning. Yes. We're in Texas, obviously, yep. in the middle of summer. Yes. Uh, so how do you, like I can imagine transporting chocolate and stuff could even be difficult, right? Yeah, so storage-wise, you know, as you see here, we do have to keep it inside. Um, outside, it's 105, 109 degrees right mm -hmm. now, so it gets pretty hot, and even transporting it to the location is tough. We have to use a lot of ice packs, mm -hmm. a cooler, and during the summer, we actually slow down on 
on selling chocolate because it's such a struggle. Mm. So uh, this is just a little bit, some items that we have to have because some locations really go through it. But in the winter, we do sell a lot more chocolate. Really? What is your best selling chocolate out of all that chocolate right the there? The M&M's. Really? And it's probably like in the top three most uh, popular items out of everything. Out of everything. Yeah. That one right there. Yeah, peanut M and M's. Peanut M and M's. So like, what is the second most popular thing, or like, if the other, the other top one? The one is Dr Pepper. We're Dr. in Texas. Dr Pepper. So Dr Pepper, we love it down here. More and, than uh, Coca Cola. Oh, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Pepper number one, uh, two or three is M&M's. Uh, the, the third one, I don't remember, I would have to double check. And this is a pretty cool little setup you got here. Uh, talk to me about, like, what does an average day look like for you? So the vending business, even though I have about 50 machines, it doesn't take long to run, which is what I like. So I can run the entire route Monday through Wednesday. Wow. So I'll go and fill up all the machines Monday through Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday is kind of where I would do like the exotic snacks, and then maybe edit a YouTube video if I film something that week. So it doesn't take a long time, and that's why I think we can handle probably a couple hundred machines before I have to hire somebody else. Yeah, and you and your girlfriend are primarily doing it right now, or does your girlfriend, like what role is she playing currently? Yeah, so she's actually the route driver. Mm. Um, she fills up most of the machines, fun fact. And you know, I gotta tell her sometimes to be careful because it can be heavy, mm. so I gotta tell her to only lift one case of drink at a time because she'll try to pull the entire <laughs> thing. But you know, yeah, she yeah. runs the route and I'm kind of like the, like the operation mm -hmm. manager, I make sure all the locations are good, they're happy, and I answer any new clients. So the goal in the immediate future is to get to a couple hundred machines. In the near future, yes, a couple hundred, but end goal, I mean, the sky's the limit. Yeah, for sure, I mean, literally, right? Your yeah. mentor, how many does he have? He has a couple hundred, but he's in like the multi-million uh, revenue. Wow, so yeah. cool. And then obviously there's all the other ancillary stuff that you're starting to dabble in too, right? Correct. Uh, which we're gonna talk about, and I'm really excited to talk about a lot of that. And yeah. and uh, you know, really, really cool to see like what you've built. And obviously we have all the boxes up here, so you're shipping. We were talking just a minute ago, which I find fascinating, like shipping chocolate. Yes. Right, and you were saying like shipping chocolate can be a pain. People have to acknowledge that yeah. it could melt and then. Exactly. You know. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a nightmare. And that's why, like I was telling you, I have to pull like a little check bar, uh, a check box that they have to check, letting them know that it's 110 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. So if the chocolate arrives melted, you know, then you know, don't get mad at me. <laughs> but they'll still check it. They'll receive the chocolate all melted. Then I get a mad email requesting a, a refund <laughs> because they can't eat it. Right. So I, like I told you. Yeah, and I've almost even decided to stop selling chocolate mm -hmm. because of that. But I mean, it still sells. Yeah. So. For sure. You, I feel like you have to do what you have to do. Yeah, and people might be asking, you know, why don't you just ship it with ice packs and mm -hmm. stuff like that? And I do. But again, it's like 110 degrees mm -hmm. on, outside, and I bet it's even harder inside of the UPS truck. Yeah. So even with those iPad, uh, ice packs, they don't last long, no. maybe 24 hours. Talk to me, Jamie, about the splits. You know, how does it work when you place a vending machine in somebody else's business? You know, are they getting a cut every time somebody buys a bag of chips, or how does that actually work? Yeah, so that's the question I get asked the most, is how much do you pay the owner, or do you have to pay like a monthly rent? Mm -hmm. Most people that just get started think it's like a fixed rate every month, maybe like 10, 20, 50, dollars a month that will cover the electric bill but most of the time it's actually a percentage of the sales mm. and the way uh, if I ever have to pay commission I let them know it's out of the net sales not mm. gross but the percentage starts at about 10 percent okay um, some vendors even do five percent but the max is maybe 25 maybe 30 percent if you get like a hotel yeah. but you know it's not as much as you would give if it was like an ATM maybe mm -hmm. because the margins are, are a lot thinner because of the snacks sure yeah and there's probably locations that they don't even care to have a percentage because yeah. you're technically adding value to their business exactly. by providing that service right yeah something I say is the smaller the location the more money they want mm. because big locations they don't care about the percentage all right. they want is a good service they want to have drinks for their employees but if you go to like a small barber shop or like an auto shop we want 25 percent we want 30 mm. percent just because yeah. you know it's more revenue for them but it's uh it, it is a convenient service that we're offering so we don't really give as much sure yeah and then obviously the business owner is paying for all the electric and everything for the vending machine to be plugged in or are you paying for that no the owner pays for the electric but you know the, the new vending machines nowadays are very energy efficient mm -hmm. uh it's maybe as much as like a fridge the the drink machines mm -hmm. the snack machines a lot less so it's they'll barely see any difference oh wow yeah. interesting and so how do they even bill you for that or they if you were to pay for that how would you track all that 
Uh, we don't. You it would just yeah. be maybe like, hey, I'll give you $20 a month. Mm -hmm. Or I, I give commission only in one location that I have. It's the laundromat that we're going to be going to. Okay. And I give them 15%. Talk me through the process of prepping to go service that actual location. So the way we do it is we actually, well, it's called pre-kitting. And that's where you grab all the product that you need for each location. We do that the night before or the day before. That way the next morning, we just load everything into the van and head out early in the morning. And you do so, that on your computer? Yeah, so we have okay. a software, it's called the VMS, and it's an inventory tracking software. Mm -hmm. And we have all of our machines plugged in, we can see exactly what's selling, how much each machine is making, and we can schedule a route. So we just put which locations we're going to on what day, and then I have an app, so they all Dang. pull up to my app, and like I was showing you, yeah, it's pretty this cool. is the location that we're gonna be going to in a bit. It's a laundromat. Mm -hmm. I have two machines there, the laundromat combo, and then the laundromat soap machine. Mm -hmm. So if we click on the combo, I'll click pre-kitting, because we're gonna get the product ready. Mm -hmm. And then this is the entire list of every item that we have to take, so this is what sold. And then on the right side, we can see the add one, add one, add, add four, and that's basically telling me to take that amount. That's awesome. And you have a machine at the laundromat that actually sells soap. Yes. Dang, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so it's the first, you know, I guess weird machine you could call it. Uh, but yeah, it's a new laundromat. So they were saying, hey, can you sell soap in the machine? And I've never done it. And you'll see when we get there, it's literally just a snack machine. Mm -hmm. I just made the coils bigger to be able to fit the soap bottles. So all you really had to do, so like on a, it kind of is, looks like this, yeah. but you made the coils bigger. Yeah, and there's some uh, wider coils, but it's just a regular snack machine. They do make some machines designed for laundromat products, but those are like eight, nine, ten thousand dollars brand new. Mm. And in my head, I was like, you know, if I spend ten thousand on the soap machine, but I get kicked out like a year later, what am I gonna do with the soap machine? Right, for so sure. So I just converted one. Maybe one day you just have to buy your own laundromat. Yeah, one and day. Then, <laughs> and then you can have the soap machine, you yeah. know? I love it, dude. Well, we'll go ahead and check that out right now then. Yeah, let's do it. And let's also, if you could, I'd love to see you like pack up everything to get ready to go out there. Of course. Awesome. Here at the laundromat, yes. Um, how much does some of the soap, you know, products cost that you're selling? So the soap and like detergent, it's all actually about the same price. Mm -hmm. I buy it for about a dollar fifty. So I do, like I was telling you, I double almost everything, or I try to. So I sell them for three dollars. Nice. And also I do pay commission. This is the location I was telling you that's one of the only ones that I do. I pay the owner fifteen percent. So I did bring the check with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just put in an envelope and yeah. I drop it off. It looks like the owner isn't here though, so. I'll probably just bring it in this, next time. I love that. And this was the machine where you were saying another one of these trays, you had to widen the coil? Yes, so these up here, uh, I didn't just because it's perfect for these boxes. Mm -hmm. But for the ones down here, I did. Because mm. even though these are pretty small, they're still wider than your average snack coil. Yep. So you can see they're pretty wide and I can fit three, four, five, six, seven back. And how, um, where did you get like the new coils? Can you just order those online? Yeah, so there's like a website where you can order parts from the manufacturer directly. I can get parts, I can get a new keypad, uh, whatever I need. Nice, I love that. And what type of machine is this right here? This is, uh, the brand is called AP. AP? The model is, one, it's a 112. Okay. So it's a pretty older machine, but like they say, they don't make them like they used to, because mm -hmm. this is like, it's all metal, good yeah. quality. The brand new ones they make nowadays, it's just more plastic. So kind of like cars, you know, they yep. say they don't make them like they used to. 
Uh, so it's a workhorse. Same type of thing. Yep. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but I own a couple of companies myself and a couple of them actually do anywhere from seven to eight figures a year. A lot of them have to do with the real estate industry, uh, real estate investing in particular. And I'd love if you would check out some of the other content on my channel. It would mean the world to me if you would consider subscribing. Also, if you know of a business that you want us to feature, definitely shoot us an email. There will be a link down in the description below. And we're always looking for new unique business businesses to go out and actually tour. Now let's just go ahead and get right back to it. So obviously you just restocked the vending machine yes. um, and you put a couple of different selections in there. We just saw you not only change the inventory, but yes. actually change the front facing like product, right? Yes. And then you mentioned you also have to change the pricing. So can you change the pricing virtually? I have to do it in front of the machine. Okay. So yeah, I got I just go into service mode. I press a button on the motherboard and then I have to, uh, it comes with like a little manual, but mm -hmm. I already have it memorized. I would press number five mm -hmm. for pricing and then one for a specific selection. So then I would pick, I can actually show you live maybe. Yeah. So yeah, to change the prices, I just press the button on the motherboard. Uh -huh. We press five, we'll see PRC for yep. price. Then I can change the price for a single selection, an entire tray or the whole machine. Got it. So I always do just per selection, let's do one. Then I'm gonna change the vitamin water because I just yep. put that one in there. I replaced it with water. So selection 50, it's 125. I sell the vitamin water for 150. Uh -huh. So let's just move that out to 150 and then enter. And then wow. I can just switch another one. But that's the only thing I had to change for now. Dude, I love that. Yeah, really easy. Super cool, yeah. yeah. But you do, in fact, have to be at the machine to do it. Yes. Yep. Got it. Yeah. But you were, you were talking about the mini marts. I'm excited to talk about that more. Yeah. In a little while. You can do all that virtually, right? And I, if anything, I probably like those a little bit more. Yeah. You know, there's a, more money to be made, but it's more work for sure also. For sure. And it, does it cost more money to get a mini mart started? Depends how fancy you want to make it look. Yeah. So it depends on what type of equipment you want and how big you want it. And you just did your first ever mini mark. Yes. Yeah, I love it. I'm excited to talk about that in a yeah. little while. So Jamie, you were just telling me a minute ago that that right there is the first machine that you ever yes. bought. And that was the machine you were telling us about a little while ago. Yes. Yeah, so five years ago, August 1st, hit five years when I bought and placed that Dang. machine on location. And as you can see, it's still up and running and I've never had a single issue with it. So that's why I think it's very important that people buy good equipment, mm -hmm. even if it costs a little bit more because it's gonna last you years and years. For sure, and what type of machine is that? The brand is Wittern uh, and it's a Wittern combo machine. Got it, okay, awesome. And then, you know, talk to me about like finding locations, right? You yeah. talked a little while ago about like, you know, finding locations. You know, a lot of people talk about like how it's so saturated, right? Yeah. Like, what do you say to the people who say it's saturated, like you can never find a good location? I think people give up too early in terms of finding locations because uh, like I was telling you, people jump into the vending industry so fast, but just as fast as people jump in, people are getting out because people will go to maybe two, three barbershops, laundromats and call it a day yeah. and just give up because they, they all said no. But I tell everyone, you know, it might take a hundred no's mm -hmm. before you actually get your first yes. So that was the first machine I bought on location. I got kicked out the next day. So I didn't have anywhere to bring it back to my house. I didn't have storage. So I had one week to find a new location. Yeah. So for the next two days, I literally sat in my, in, in my room for hours and hours calling businesses until that barbershop gave me a yes. Wow. If somebody's watching and they're first getting started, right? Do you recommend the best way to getting a location is like over the phone? Or do you recommend people like go drive around their local area and like walk in and talk to the business owners like face to face. Yeah. I tell everyone to figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are. So for example, even though I might look uh, like an ongoing person on camera, you know, in person I'm actually pretty shy and I would be terrified walking into a business, talking to the owner and asking them if I can put my machine in there. Mm -hmm. But I am very good at um, advertising my website and emailing locations. Mm -hmm. So that's how I find most of my locations. But you know, if you're like a people person and you're comfortable talking to people, then your best bet is gonna go door to door right. and talk to people face to face. Yeah, so if you're shy, get out there, make it happen. You know, at the end of the day, you can just send an email too, right? Yeah, exactly. And you just like craft the email really well, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And uh, you know, I'm sure it's just a numbers game too. Yeah, and at the same time, even if you're shy, it's something that you're gonna have to work on because yeah, I'm shy, but I used to be a lot more shyer. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, even once you start placing machines on location, you're still gonna have to be talking to customers, responding to calls about machines not working. So you're still gonna be talking to a lot of people. So you have to be comfortable doing that. Right. So if you're shy, you gotta stop being shy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do the honor. How do I do it? Okay. Just like an ATM. Oh, not just like an ATM. Uh, you see the button on top? Uh huh. Press that the blue button? while you pull out. Oh, nice. And then it's easier than just, an ATM. Yeah. And then like this. Oops. Yep. And then push the cash back and take it out. And then like, without ripping any bills. Yes. And then we'll see, do we have any fives? Oh, we, we got, got a couple. Multiple it's always, fives. Uh, it's always good luck if you find a five at the very front. Really? Yeah. Oh, we got another five there. How much do you think, oh, and another five here. How much do you think this is? Uh, I would say about maybe $40. Really? 30, 40, yeah. I feel like this is way more than that. Yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. Maybe with the fives, yeah, but, um, it's funny because a lot of times I go and collect cash from my machines, and I don't uh -huh. put out, I don't pull out a lot of money, and, and even, I even have to ask myself, am I really making money? Because right. it doesn't feel like it, but it goes back to you know it's all in the card readers. For sure, yeah, it's a lot of it's in the card. You were saying sixty percent. About yeah. yeah, some locations are more, some are less, but about. Pretty cool. There's the coins. Right. That's quite a bit of money in quarters. Yeah, maybe about a hundred dollars, maybe. Yeah, I bet it is, especially between the two. Yeah. You know. So Jamie, talk to me a little bit about where you get the product. You know, uh, now you've been in the business obviously for quite some time. Yes. Have you found that going to like Costco or Sam's Club is better or going direct to the distributor? I currently buy all of my product from maybe like five, six different sources. And the reason is because there's not one source that's gonna be the best and has the most variety for the lowest price. So Sam's Club is always going to be your mm. cheapest option. But the thing about Sam's Club is that they don't have a large variety. Mm. So for drinks, they might just have uh, like your Coke, your Dr. Pepper and your Sprite, but they don't have like that flavored soda, like mm. Fanta's or Big Red. So those either I would go to Walmart or yes, I do have an account with Coke and Pepsi directly. Mm -hmm. Those, uh, it's, it's a minimum that you have to order. So I had to wait a couple of years until I can order enough product from them. And then there's a couple other warehouses here in my city that I go to and Got it. buy product. So if somebody was just starting in the vending machine business, would you recommend they just go to Sam's Club for the first couple of years? Yeah, Sam's Club's gonna be the cheapest. Uh, I think the membership starts at about maybe $30. And like I said, the prices are gonna be the cheapest. Got so it. your soda, like for example, the Sprite, mm -hmm. these you can buy from Sam's Club for about 70 cents a unit. Okay. Uh, maybe like 65 cents. So you can easily double your money and sell it for 125. Uh, we have ours at 175. Okay. So uh, we got good margins on those. But if you buy, for example, like a 20 ounce bottle of soda from Coke directly, mm. theirs are like a dollar and 20 cents. Oh, wow. Yeah. Way more Almost money. for what we sell them for. Dang. So it's not really worth me buying from Coke or Pepsi right now. Yeah. Is the average markup typically about like double? Like if you buy a product for a dollar, do you typically want to try to sell for $2? Is there any sort of like formula to that? Yeah. So right now for me, I at least double every item. Some mm. items do have better margins to where I can triple them, but good rule of thumb for mm. me is at least double. And I feel like that's a mistake that a lot of new vendors make is they want to be the cheapest out there. Mm. So they don't look at the exact percentage for the profit margin. Um, but for me, I have to double everything to cover the cost of my warehouse and everything yeah. and make sure I make enough money. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love that. And does it depend at all on the location and the demographic of people or do you just kind of have a price and regardless of the location that like the price is the price? Uh, yeah, it depends a little bit on the location. So for example, if it's a corporate office building, I'll kind of have the prices a little bit higher because <laughs> they can afford it. Yeah. Uh, but if it's like a nursing home where it's mainly just older residents there that get $25 a week for mm. their allowance, then that's where I have the lowest prices. Sure, yeah, no, I definitely love that. And talk to me while we're in the warehouse a little bit about your warehouse itself. Like at what point did you decide that you needed a warehouse? So my last apartment, I had a garage. Mm -hmm. It was a town home and I ran my business out of that garage. I've made a lot of YouTube videos about it and great memories there. But I ended up getting so many locations the last couple of years that I eventually ran out of space. And I wanted to have more space to keep machines here, work on them because I also had a storage unit mm. and I had to go back and forth between them. So, I mean, this place, it wasn't too expensive. Yeah. I was able to afford it. So I was like, it's great for me right now and I'll be able to grow into it in the, the three year lease that I have. Yeah, that's awesome. What, if you don't mind me asking, does something like this run like about a thousand or 1500 a month? Or? Yeah, it's uh, 1500 yeah. and it's about 2300 square feet. So it's actually one of the cheapest 
I found for the yeah. size. When would you recommend, I guess, like if somebody was just starting in the vending business, like when do you think they would need to get a warehouse? Like how long do you think they could run it out of their garage? I think the you can wait a pretty long time. I met a vendor recently that he has about 100 machines on location and he mm. still runs it out of his garage. Wow. So you don't really want to move into a warehouse because it's an extra expense. You want to keep as much money as you can. But if you want to be organized and professional, then maybe yeah. once you start actually making maybe $10,000 sure. a month. 10000 a month, yeah. And that guy must not have an HOA. Uh, yeah, no, he doesn't. <laughs> right. I love it. You just started your first mini market, right? Yes. And talk to me about the difference between a mini market and a vending machine. The biggest difference is that a mini market or a micro market, people call it different, is it's basically like a self checkout kiosk. So, you know, when you go to Walmart, you scan your items of one item at a time, then you pay at the end yourself. So, that's kind of what it is. And it sounds like a great idea, but I know a lot of vendors don't like it because it's like a, it's self serve. So people can technically just grab the item and walk away mm. without paying for it. Well, first off, I have cameras installed. Yeah. So if I catch people stealing, I'll save the footage, I'll send it over to the management and say, hey, these are the people that stole. And all I ask is for you to do something about it because uh, people have gotten fired before over a Snickers bar, over a bag of chips. So I always let them know like, hey, if they're stealing a bag of chips from me, what are they stealing from you? Mm. So mm. it's better for them to set that example with the first person, that way the rest of the crowd doesn't steal. Yeah, is the best place like for a micro or mini market to do like in a commercial building where it's mostly like employee only? Yeah, so the mar markets, you can only place them in employee only. I've seen mm. companies start placing them in like public places, like at the airport here in the Dallas airport, there's a couple micro markets. But I think um, it's better for employee only mm -hmm. locations. So office buildings, warehouses. Yeah, because you have a relationship with the employer, right? Yeah. And like you were telling me a little while ago that you literally have a contract with the employer that you yes. will cover the cost of up to, I think you said 2%. 2%. So explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so with vending machines, I never do a contract. I always just give them a good service. But with markets, since you have the risk of people stealing, then yeah, I have to make them sign an agreement, mm -hmm. letting, them, letting them know that if people steal, um, they're gonna have to pay for it. Yeah. Not every business wants to pay for it though, so that's whenever you can tell them like, okay, well, if you don't wanna pay for it, then at least mm -hmm. fire this employee. Yeah. And what do you think it would cost if somebody wanted to go start a mini market? What do you think it would be to, to start one up? It depends on, on the size. So for example, the first one I placed is two coolers, one freezer, and then two snack shelves. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty big. That one was about 15,000, okay. I would say. So it was pretty expensive, but it, it holds a lot of inventory. It was meant for a location with about two, 300 employees. But uh, you can have smaller ones, maybe just one cooler, one snack shelf. And the kiosk is the biggest expense. So that'll cost you anywhere from three to 6,000. Wow, all right. And how much would you expect to make on like that micro market? Um, so the more employees you have, the more money that you're gonna make, of course. But the great thing about markets is that the average amount per transaction is a lot higher than vending machines. Mm. Because of course, if you have a soda and a snack machine next to each other, the customer might just buy a snack, mm. they might just buy a drink, or if you're lucky, they'll buy both. Yeah. But with the market, people are just grabbing items, you know, a bag of chips. Um, I showed you a video that you can <laughs> probably show them. Yep. I have a customer that buys six Mountain Dews at a time every Friday. So you make more money mm -hmm. that, in that way. So a micro market at the end of the day, like what type of person would you recommend getting into that industry? And what type of person would you recommend just going the vending machine route? I know some people have gone straight into micro markets, but I think uh, it's probably better for you to start with vending mm -hmm. because you still want to get used to managing uh, inventory, mm -hmm. talking to customers, because uh, even though it's pretty similar to vending, it's still a completely different game. Uh, it's more inventory that you have to track because you got to make sure people aren't stealing. So it takes more work. Uh, so the easiest bet would be starting with vending machines. I love that. So if you're watching, start with a vending machine. And also you have a course where you actually teach people about, about vending machines. How do yes. people find that? So I promote it through my social media, Instagram and YouTube. And the reason I, I started that is because, you know, people would DM me all the time. Hey, can you help me start a vending machine yeah. business? And I would help probably hundreds of people. But then I would reach back out a couple weeks from now and be like, hey, how's it going so far? And they would just be like, oh, no, I decided to do something else. Yeah. So I was wasting a lot of time helping people out for free. Uh, so I decided yeah. to just take the people that were serious yeah. and actually do like a one-on-one. -on -one. Which is really cool. And how do people figure out about the one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, so we, they, they can actually book a call directly through my team. It's uh, vendingempire.org. 
And like I said, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a three month program. We'll walk you through like literally A through Z, setting up your uh, permits and all the way to figuring out what machines to buy mm -hmm. and then how to find a location. I love so that. we try to do all that within the three months. Vendingempire.org. Yes. And we'll put the information down below. And I want to go talk in just a minute about the coffee and okay. the water. Yeah. Okay, we'll go do that now. So you're starting to get into the coffee business yes. and you bought that machine right there. Yes, very and expensive. Probably more than a lot of machines I buy actually. What did it cost? About 4,500. 4,500 yeah. for a coffee machine. Yeah, just for this. It's uh, one of the best though, so it's mm -hmm. worth the money. What does it do? So this is what you call a bean to cut machine. Mm -hmm. So it actually has a grinder inside to grind the whole beans. So it's a good selling point because with ground coffee, you know, people that actually are coffee drinkers, they'll be able to taste the difference between ground coffee and whole beans. So it makes a huge difference. What type of like upkeep does it take? That's the thing about the coffee service is you kind of have to train one of the one of the employees at that location to do like the basic maintenance. And it's simple stuff that I can show you in a bit, uh, but there's like daily, weekly, and monthly maintenance on it. Let's open it up. I wanna, yeah. I wanna see what it looks like. Let's check it out. So I do have it plugged in. Uh -huh. I've been testing it. That's why you can see a whole bunch of uh, coffee grounds already used. Yep. But the great thing about this machine is that you also have like uh, a milk and chocolate powder inside. Dang. So you can actually make uh, cappuccinos and lattes with this. So you put the beans up here and then what is that little wheel right there? This is the filter paper. Mm -hmm. So the way it makes the coffee is through like a reverse French press. It's mm -hmm. one of the met methods to make coffee. And it just basically it's extracts more coffee, making it taste better and fresher. Dang. So it's a really good machine and makes a lot of different drink. Yeah. And what is your game plan with a coffee machine? Like obviously you've got 50, you know, vending machine locations. You know a lot of the owners. Um, you know, you're getting more delivered, like yeah. you're growing, right? Are you planning to rent that machine out? Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna be renting it to the location and I just started to start doing it because I started growing my vending business and I have a lot of office and warehouse locations. And sometimes when I would put my vending machines in there, they would ask me, hey, do you also provide coffee? And I would always say no, because I didn't. But I started doing more research about it. Uh, my mentor that I was telling you about, he does a lot of coffee, so mm. he kind of taught me what machines to get, you know, where to get the products from, what type of beans to use and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And what do you think you'll be able to rent out a machine like that for? And is the main income stream from the, renting the machine itself or do you make money on like the coffee and all of that too? I make the money on actually selling the coffee itself. So the renting, I'm gonna be charging the location $100 a month. Mm -hmm. And that's basically because they're gonna start with about a, uh, 30 employees. So I don't think they're gonna be using it as much. But once they get to about 100 employees, I'll probably just waive that monthly rent fee and just charge them for the coffee itself. Got it. So you'll eventually work to get them the machine for free. Yeah. And then will you be the one actually coming and delivering the coffee then? Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna deliver the coffee, the cups, the lids, the milk, the chocolate, and I'm gonna be doing the weekly and monthly maintenance, which is basically taking literally everything apart, cleaning it, sanitizing it, and make sure it's working properly. The only thing they have to do is refill the beans if they get empty, refill the milk and chocolate if that gets empty, and of course, empty out the waste bin. Dang, I'm telling you right now, I own a couple of different businesses, real estate being yeah. some of the businesses I own. I would definitely pay, pay somebody like you to come do all yeah. what you just described for me. Yeah. You know, like I wouldn't want to do that <laughs> if I was a business owner, you know? Yeah. Like but... it's a lot of work to go and like have somebody, you know, a secretary or mm -hmm. somebody deliver everything and exactly. like upkeep the entire machine. Yeah, we try to provide the entire break room service. So everything from vending to coffee. And then like I was mentioning, we want to do water also. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in the future also other services. Okay, so we're standing here, Jamie, in what would you call this? So this is the front office of the space and this is where I run my exotic snack business. Exotic snack business. Yep. Walk me through what that is. So, you know, other countries make flavors that the U.S. doesn't for brands that we know, like Lay's, Oreos, Pringles, Twix. Mm -hmm. So I import them and I sell them on my website. Which is really cool, by the way. You were showing me one a minute ago. This is beer flavor. <laughs> yeah, beer flavor Lay's. <laughs> I've never, like, I, I never thought the day would come where I would see that. Open it up. And really, it tastes like beer. Oh, well, right now you yeah, can open, open it? it? Yeah. All right. We're going to do it live. Ooh. Okay, we're going to taste it. Smell it? it smells like beer. Does it? I feel like it smells and tastes like the like the foam part of the beer. Okay, let's get a little baby one. <laughs> it does taste like beer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> How much is it back? What does this run? So about six dollars. Six dollars. Yeah. Okay. Everything is you know pretty expensive, and that's the mm -hmm. complaint we get the most. But you know with importing costs and fees, uh, I mean I'm paying maybe like three dollars for it. 
So I'll basically so, double it also. How do you import an exotic snack? Uh, I had to find suppliers, and like I was telling you, it took me about eight months to find. Mm -hmm. So I had to find suppliers from each country and just build a relationship with them. Say, hey, can you send me the stuff? And of course, I'll pay you for it. But yeah, the question I get asked the most is people that see me do this is, hey, you know, where do you buy the product from? Mm -hmm. And it's not like a website you can just go and buy all this stuff from. You have to find a supplier. For sure. Yeah, you were saying it took you a long time to like figure it all out, right? Yeah, a long time. But uh, as you can see, I was able to source a mm -hmm. lot of really cool stuff. Yeah, do you sell any of this in your actual vending machines? No, people have been telling me to do that. I feel like it's a, a, a great idea. It's just about the location. Mm. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. of course, if you put all this stuff in like in an office building where they just want some regular Cheeto Puffs, they probably won't buy a $6 bag of chips. Right. But if we go to maybe like a mall or like an, at an airport, that would be a good idea. And that's something uh, hopefully I can do one day. That'd be really cool. I feel like you'd have to have a way to like tell them a story about like why yeah. you're selling it. You know, like there'd have to be like a picture of like, hey, here's yeah. what this is. Right? Yeah, there's some pretty cool vending machines that you can sell like specialty items with like some huge touch screens. Mm -hmm. So I think a machine like that would be perfect for the, these items because, you know, we can put like a promotional video of like where the item is from mm -hmm. and why they're priced the way they are. Yeah, that'd be really <laughs> cool. I like that. So we're checking out all of your exotic drinks and you've got a lot of really cool like exotic drinks in here. We were talking about like the orange Fanta, right? Yes. Uh, it's a white peach. White peach Fanta. Yeah. Which is really interesting. I've never seen that before. Yeah, I got a lot of like, I guess you could say normal flavors like peach and apple. But of course, you know, you got to have the crazy stuff. So this one is pretty cool. It's a 7-Up mm -hmm. Mojito, which is um, an alcoholic drink. But, yeah. you know, it doesn't have alcohol. But it, it's, uh, it's pretty good. That, and it, I mean, I've never seen anything like that before. Yeah, that you one's know? from France. Another thing that I've never seen before is that right there. The giant Fruit Loop. The, that is one single Fruit Loop. Yeah, it's one. Uh, <laughs> you can guess what color it is. I've opened it. Really? Okay, don't mess it up. One single <laughs> Fruit Loop. I've never seen that in my life. What country is that? Like, what uh, is that? It's uh, here in the U.S. So there's a company called Mischief, uh -huh. and they make a lot of, I guess, um, off-brand yeah. items like these. So this is not it's not a legit Fruit Loop. Mm -hmm. It's a different company, but they make stuff like this, and they actually also made the Mischief Pepsi and the Wow. Fanta. And the Barefoot Wine, that's actually a real Barefoot Wine. Yes. But it's an Oreo Barefoot Wine. Yeah, they did a collab with Barefoot, and this is actually very, very rare. You can only buy it off of their website, which sold out in like seconds. And I just wow. got lucky that I got two bottles. I opened one of them, I tasted it, I tried offering him, he didn't want to <laughs> taste it. Uh, it's not good, but like I was saying, it's just for an experience. Yeah, maybe when we're done filming, I'll be able to try <laughs> a little bit of it, but I, I still got to stay sharp for the camera, yeah, you know? Of course. <laughs> I love it, dude. Yeah, and you know, this is kind of a cool little hobby, I feel like, that you have, right? Yeah, I mean, I've always liked snacks, even before I even had a job. I've always just liked munching on, mm. on chips and candy. I have a sweet tooth, so it's just what I know. Yeah, which is so cool, you know, and then you get to do, run the vending machine company, and this is just something you can do like a day or two out of the week. Yeah, just an Super extra cool. side income to fund my vending machine business. Yeah, I love that, man. So talk to me a little bit, Jamie, about like the numbers, you know, for somebody watching, I mean, like, how much does it really cost to get into the vending machine business? I started with $2,500, and I feel like that's a good number to start with because the more money you spend on machines, probably the better because you can get nicer equipment. Mm. You don't want to start with uh, the cheapest you can find because a lot of people will buy a three, four hundred dollar snack machine, which you can find some at that price. But it's a machine that's maybe like 20, 30, 30 years old that you can't even add a credit card reader to it. And people don't know that. Mm. So you can't add a card reader to just any machine. So I think twenty five hundred could get you a good snack machine, a good, a good drink machine. Uh, but of course, the more the better. Yeah, for sure. And do you recommend that people buy a brand new machine? Is there places where people can buy like a used machine? What do you think? I think uh, if you can get a, a new machine, then yeah, I would recommend it because if you buy a brand new machine, one, you know, it's going to be working out of the box. Second, they give you a warranty on parts for like two years. And three, you can finance machines a lot mm. of the times. So you can sometimes maybe start your vending machine business with almost no money down wow. if you can finance machines. Yeah, and I'm sure you could also probably throw a vending machine on the credit card as well, right? Yeah, exactly. And another thing that people don't know is that you can actually get free machines from Coke or Pepsi mm. if you just buy the product from them directly. No way. So they'll give you free drink machines, but you know, again, they give you like a minimum of maybe 10 cases a month or something. So you would have to make sure you at least find a good first location to be able to buy that much. Obviously, you own 50 machines, yep. right? What is like the average that a machine does if you had to put an average to it? Obviously, it depends on the location, I'm yeah. sure, right? 
I think they've uh, there's like an association that has come up with a average per machine, and it's about four to five hundred dollars a month. Okay. And it's actually per location, so yep. for two machines. But you know, again, that's that could be on the low end because my least performing machine makes me, yeah, maybe like three, four hundred. But I have some locations making thirty five hundred, four thousand dollars a month. So, what is your best out of all the locations that you have? Your highest uh, earning vending machine location? The highest one right now is a convention center, and it doesn't do good like every single day. It because they have events, they have concerts, stuff like that. So it's mainly when they have events, uh, I could do maybe two, three, four hundred dollars for that night. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they have probably 200 employees there. Wow. And how would you recommend for somebody watching? Like, I would imagine getting a location like that is more difficult than just like your average location, right? Like, is there any recommendation you would have to eventually getting into somewhere like that? Yeah, so it's important that people make connections because the way I was able to get that location is because I used to know, or I still know the previous vendor that used to run it. Mm -hmm. He was getting out of the business, so he came to me and asked me if I wanted it. And of course I took it, uh, but of course the more people you know, the more access you have to more locations. I've heard people start a vending industry and they work at a warehouse with maybe like 200 employees where they don't have machines. So they just go and ask their boss. Mm. You know, it could be as simple as that. So yeah, the more connections, the better locations you could get, but it doesn't just um, come down to that. Yeah, at the end of the day, you've got to get out there and network with people, I feel yeah. like, right? A lot of people might look at this industry or this business and say like, oh yeah, but you have to have all the product, right? Yeah. And you've got the warehouse and the machine and all of that, like, you know, how much profit do you actually make, right? And, and I'd love to kind of get your thought on that. Yeah, well, the biggest expense is the product, of course, and that comes down to about 45%. So you're left with about a 55% profit margin. And yeah, that doesn't include gas and rent and everything else, but that's why I was mentioning that the way I price my items, um, I have to at least double it. Mm -hmm. some, some of them I do triple it, but you have to be minimum double in order to cover everything. And the way I did it the first couple of years, that was a huge mistake, is I used to do it by not by a percentage, but by a certain amount. So mm. if I at least made 50 cents for an item, then that was good for me. Mm. But you know, a monster, for example, will make a huge difference. If they were gonna focus on a type of location, you know, whether it be like barbershops or like, you know, whatever it might be, like laundry mats, right, obviously, mm -hmm. like, do you have a favorite type of location? Yeah, my favorite is industrial places, and that's mainly because I'm down here in Texas, so it's there's industrial everywhere uh, with a lot of employees, so that's mainly what I target. But I know other people in smaller cities might not have a lot, so it's just anywhere with high foot traffic. Yeah. Could be a dealership, could be a laundromat, uh, an office building, so. Mm -hmm. How do you determine that? Like when you're talking to a business owner, like how much foot traffic did they have? Do you just ask them? Yeah, I straight up ask them, and it's very important that I do it before, but even a lot of the times, believe it or not, they lie. Mm. about how many employees they have I bet. because they might not have a lot of employees so a bigger company might not want them because some bigger companies have like a minimum mm -hmm. maybe it could be a hundred employees could be 200 but yeah I, I ask them and then they'll tell me but what I've noticed is I have to ask them how many employees are actually in the building mm. because they'll give me like a like the total amount of employees but 80% of them could be working from home right which makes you know, it, it makes it real. Especially in 2023. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, and I've been through that. I've had a location tell me they have like a hundred employees. So I'll go and buy some really nice, big, fancy machines. I get there. I don't see a lot of people in the parking lot. So I'll go inside and ask them like, hey, is everyone on, on break or what's going on? <laughs> and they're like, oh no, most of them just work from home. Yeah. So it was just like, yeah, yeah. What the I heck? spent all this money. Yeah. I had a bring those machines back and bring smaller mm -hmm. ones. Then you gotta find a new location for it yeah. probably too, right? Exactly. Yeah. So you just had two brand new vending machines just delivered right now? Yes. Um, and these are two that we haven't seen yet. So what is the uh, brand of both of these two vending machines? So this is a 501E. It's a what's called a stacker drink machine. Okay. So the drinks are actually being stacked on top of each other. I can probably open it up real quick yeah, and show really you. Yeah, that'd be really cool. But it also has three, six, nine selections. Oh, wow. So it's good for like smaller break rooms uh, compared to that one where you have 40 selections. Mm -hmm. And like, what is the, I mean, is this like a really good vending machine in terms of like it not breaking, like, is it reliable? Yeah, 501Es are like one of the most reliable machines that 
vendors use. Oh wow. And so you just stack all the drinks like right inside yeah, of here. They stack on top. You can put bottles, you can put cans, and it holds about five to six hundred cans. Wow. So it's so it smaller, holds a lot. but it still holds a lot. Dang, and then this whole thing is like completely refrigerated. Yes. Got it. Okay. And then what type of machine do we have right here uh, next to that one? This is a Dixie Narco 5800, okay. uh, which is also called the BevMax 4. And it's the only drink machine I use for every location just really? because visually it looks so much better. I mean, this machine looks nice too, don't get me wrong, but physically seeing the bottles, locations love that. They look nice. Yeah. The only uh, downside is it has like a little arm that goes up and grabs the drink. But if that arm for some reason gets jammed or stops working, the entire machine is down. Right. Compared to this, where if one selection is jammed, you can still buy from the other ones. Mm. So it's very annoying. The it, the service calls I get the most is about this machine. Really. But if you know how to work it, you know, yeah. and take care of it, then you know what to do. What did you pick this machine up for? Uh, I would imagine you bought that used. Yeah, this is uh, it's refurbished, so it is used, but they clean it up. They make sure everything's working. I bought it from a local supplier for about forty five hundred. Brand new. These are like eight thousand. Jamie, I had a lot of fun today. I really appreciate you letting us tour your business. You know, we talked about numbers, we talked about everything. Thank you uh, for being so transparent and honest and just open with everybody. Yeah, hopefully you learned a thing or two and you'll probably go back and start your own vending business now. Yeah, I just might, dude. I just <laughs> might. I'll probably call you. Yeah, anytime. I'll partner with you, you know. Sounds good. Uh, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram or YouTube at Jaime Ibanez. I make videos about my vending machine business, collecting cash, or if you just want to be entertained and see me fill up some machines, come check me out. Dude, really appreciate it, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.